Hi, good afternoon. Well, my name is Natalia. I'm a PhD student at Professor Rafael Nezmanovic's lab at University, University of Montreal. And today I will be talking a little bit about the dynamics of um, viral glycoproteins. Um, here we will be talking a little bit about the spike protein of coronavirus. Um, well, I don't think we need much introduction on coronaviruses anymore, unfortunately. But the spike uh, protein, let me get the pointer, um, it has two conformational states and it needs to be in its open conformational state where it opens the receptor binding domain in order to bind to the receptors of host cells. So this is a very important part of transmission. And since this dynamic is so important, it makes sense for us to study the dynamics of those proteins. Since it's the afternoon of the last day of conference, I guess everybody's tired and I will start by presenting results then. Um, well, what we were able to achieve with this, this work that I will be presenting was that we were the first to suggest that an open a favored open conformational state would be associated with the epidemiological success of new variants. We were also able to successfully predict uh, several of the main mutations of alpha, gamma, and uh, alpha, beta, and gamma variants. Um, we were able to create a technique that is currently coupled with methods used to monitor and characterize new variants of concern. And we were able to do all of that with a technique that is highly applicable for large data sets. How did we do that? With income that probably most of you checked two um, talks about it yesterday already. Um, Oli presented very well the method, so I will present it a little bit more quickly. It stands for Elastic Network Contact Model, and it is a coarse-grained normal mode analysis method. So it means that we are considering the level of residues, not all, all atoms, and we are considering that these residues um, behave like masses connected by springs, and those uh, uh, these uh, several coupled oscillators describe these ranges of movement of each one of those residues. And this movement is um, calculated considering the distance between those residues and the type of contact that they have between themselves. And this the surface of contact and the type of contact make our method an NMA method that is sensitive to sequence. And therefore, we can model mutations and check the effect of those mutations in the dynamics of, of structures. One of the functions that was part of both talks from, from my lab yesterday uh, is the dynamical signature in which we consider the eigenvectors and associated eigenvalues that describe the movement of each residual to calculate kind of a B factor, a measure of uh, uh, the range of flexibility of each one of those residuals. And therefore, as an output, we have a vector describing the flexibility of each one of those residuals that constitute the structure. In the beginning of the pandemic, in the summer of 2020, one specific mutation became very common in Europe, which was Z614G. And when we first started working this project around May of 2020, um, this was the only uh, new mutation that we could, could search according to the 23,000 uh, structure uh, sequences that we had available at, at the time. For comparison, currently we have almost 12 million uh, sequences available for coronaviruses. Um, when we uh, first uh, simulated this single mutation in the structures for the closed and the open state, here you can see um, these uh, uh, vectors, um, for the closed state, which is in purple, we saw that especially around the mutation, we had an increased flexibility, which you can, guys can see here. And but that makes sense because we we are making a substitution for a glycine. So it makes sense that since it's a smaller residual, the flexibility will be a little bit increased around that, that area. But our most interesting result was when we checked that for the, the uh, open structure, because we had many more results, not only around the mutation, but around all the, the B chain, that is the open chain, um, around the N-terminal domain, parts of the RBG as well. And that made us think that because the flexibility is increased in the closed structure and the flexibility is decreased in the open structure, maybe this, this new mutation was making the spike protein more prone to open and less pro prone to close. At that time, the only way that we could compare this uh, hypothesis was to compare it to the old SARS-CoV spike that we also had structures for. And we did this comparison expecting to see opposite results. And we did see opposite results. So the old SARS-CoV spike 
was more uh, rigid in the closed state and more flexible in the open state, especially around the open RBD. So next um, function that we used was to calculate the flexibility of this full structure instead of residual per residue. And we did that, all, once again, using the eigenvalues associated with each one of the, of the residuals. And we did that to be able to calculate in a, simplifier me a simplified method, uh, a high throughput evaluation of every single possible um, single mutation that we could perform in most of the structure. So we stopped around the position 900 because after that it's transmembrane region. So the movement of that is not that relevant. And we saw for the closed and the open state, we did this calculation and we created a new measure considering both these values, which is VDS, vibrational difference score. And we saw that even though the G614G had interesting results in this heat map, it's, it is kind of reddish, but we had many mutations in many positions all around in the RBG and the internal domain where we had much more relevant results, for example, for the K417 mutations and on the other side, so uh, making the closed stage more rigid and the open state more flexible, we had many mutations as well, for example, in the position R355. Um, after that, we introduced, we used for the first time, I believe, um, a new, another of the functions that income has, which is the transition probability function. Because an increased flexibility of one specific residual not necessarily will make this residual move to one specific other position. Um, so instead of just using the, this increased flexibility to try to understand if this protein is more prone to go to another conformational state, we did this overlap between the, the eigenvector that describes the movement of those residuals and the movement needed to go from one conformational state to the other, in the case of spike, from the closed state to the open state. So if this eigenvector is overlapping a little bit better, then we have a, a, a favored B state. And we did that for our top 64 candidates and bottom 20 candidates um, for comparison reasons. Um, we coupled it with a Markov chain in order to be able to predict an open occupancy estimation. Um, at that time, now we were already in October. In October, the, our hypothesis about the D614G was proven. A preprint checked the occupancy and saw that it was actually uh, um, impairing the open occupancy. And we had, because of that, we had six experimental points of slightly different uh, structures that people engineered and evaluated occupancies. And with those six exper experimental results, we optimized two parameters, one associated with the transition probability um, function and one with the Markov chain. And we had a very good correlation of uh, 0.89. And we used that to, uh, uh, to calculate an open, open occupancy estimation for those 84 um, um, candidates that I'm showing. For several of our top candidates that you see in red, we had actually a larger open occupancy than wild type, that is around 25%, including very, a lot higher um, for, a position, for the position N501, specifically, that we got open occupancy estimations of up to 60%. And for comparison, our bottom candidates, we almost created a locked state with open occupancy around 1%. And then we were going to try to validate it experimentally, but then unfortunately nature kind of validated it for us because three of our top candidates were N501Y, um, K417N and K417T. Many mutations in the K417N and N501 were among our top candidates. And those became later the, some of the main mutations of alpha, beta and gamma variants. Um, so here, when alpha happened and, and um, N501Y was in it, we thought, okay, so maybe it kind of validates our, our work. However, uh, deep mutations can result from Bloom's lab in, in Seattle did uh, uh, the calculation for binding for many um, single mutations and saw that this specific mutation was increasing binding a lot. So maybe that was the binding to a suit. So maybe that was the reason why it was selected and not the occupancy aspects that we were calculating. However, for beta, beta and gamma that appeared two weeks later, um, we had these mutations on the K417. And those mutations, according to Bloom's data, were actually uh, decreasing binding by a lot. So you would not explain their selection. And they appeared in two different variants, two different substitutions, kind of in the same time. 
and the E484 that was a, mute, a, a position that was later um, associated with immunescape. So we already started to see mutations that were associated with immunescape back in January 2021. So then the final um, function of income that I will be presenting is the conformational ensemble, which creates a, a multi-model PGB file with slightly different structures based on the distribution of those structures along this possible movement of residues. Um, why are we using that currently? Because when we checked for alpha, beta, and, and gamma, we saw actually, and it, it was later proving experimentally as well, that they were all actually um, having an increased open occupancy as we predicted. But from delta on, the su successful variants were not in the way of having an, uh, an open uh, state confirmation increased. Actually, um, compared to the current uh, to the latest uh, variants, they were actually having a favored closed state confirmation. Our hypothesis for that is that the receptor binding motif is such an important epitope that maybe because of immunescape, the virus was facing this trade-off of decreasing its transmissibility because of the open state occupancy um, in order to escape uh, immune recognition by hiding its receptor binding motif. So we, if we wanted to keep predicting new variants, we had to evaluate something else other than the, just the, the open state occupancy. When Omicron appeared, experimentalists worked very hard and very fast because we had lots of structures within one or two weeks. And those structures were accompanied by articles that were listing interactions, specific interactions that were gained or lost. Um, in uh, compared to wild type or previous variants and um, giving a list of residues that were associated with those interactions. But when we checked those articles, they were not agreeing between themselves. Their, their lists were a bit different. The strength of binding that they, they were predicting for a new variant was a little bit different. And when we looked at those structures, it was kind of explained because those structures were different between themselves. So if you are evaluating one structure as an aesthetic uh, um, entity, then, there, then you will see different interactions in that interface. But because we do have the conformational ensemble too, we could maybe evaluate this interface or these interactions considering a larger range of structures to model new uh, variants or a set of mutations and try to predict these effects on, on binding. For now, we are still with preliminary results, but here, I, ha I, ha I have the feeling that it will work because here we have uh, the confirmation ensembles for the BA1, which was called Omicron back then, but now we have many Omicrons. Um, and these are the, the um, residues that are having changes in interactions according to different uh, um, references. And we were able to capture all those differences in interactions when we did these interactions for a distribution of 32 confirmations. Um, slightly different uh, uh, conformational ensembles. And we um, compare this distribution to see um, which interactions were significantly different to the distribution of the wild type. And we were able to capture all the interactions that they were seeing in those different articles. Why do we want to do that? Since we have, for, ex for example, the deep mutation scan for binding for many single mutations. We want to do that because, as I mentioned in the beginning, our tool is currently coupled with uh, methods to monitor and characterize new variants. Um, so currently it is um, coupled to SPEAR, which is a systematic protein annotator for sequences, um, which is a work do, done, do, done in collaboration with Northumbria University um, and funded by COG UK. And currently it takes as input sequences and gives as output um, pre-calculated uh, uh, measures, so experimental measures for the binding to the receptor and immunescape, and our measures for VDS when it comes to, to the occupancy. But our method is a method that can be done in large scale. So we could be calculating uh, effects on occupancy, not only for single mutations that we already have done, but for sets of new mutations of those new variants. But those experimental results cannot follow that because many mutations are happening all the time. So we want to um, validate um, interface methods using those experimental results to be able to apply them using these conformational states as well to a set of mutations to correct, that characterize any possible future um, variant and create what we think will be um, the first uh, um, coupled way of evaluating all these different properties that are 
being driving that, that are we are seeing as driving forces for um, SARS-CoV-2 evolution. Well, I talked about a very specific application. There are many other possible applications, but you guys saw that because we had to talk about them. If you did not see those, um, now poster sessions also ended, so you can talk to us during the coffee break, but our videos are in the platform, so you can check them out as well. Uh, but uh, probably our tools can help you somehow if you have a family of proteins to evaluate, if conformational ensembles are something that you guys wanna do, or if these um, coarse range way of evaluating dynamics or conformational transitions um, can help you somehow. I would like to thank all the people from my lab. I'm very lucky to work with awesome people and every institution that made this research possible. And here is where you can find our tool, which is currently a Python package. So very, very easy to use. And as I mentioned, applicable to a um, large data set. So if you want to test it in one single structure, it will be quite fast. And also the uh, pa the spike on the, the paper on spike, which is the first part of the results that I showed until the transition probabilities. And I would be happy to take questions if I still have time for questions. Great. Um, it's more on the technical side. Um, do you have some sort of um, score to give the confidence per residue for the ensembles you are generating with the Encom tool? No, not currently. Or and, and then, how do you check that the conformational diversity you are generating reflects the real partition function that represents that structure? This partition function thing is something that I'm trying currently with the, the ensembles that we done for, for new variants. But currently, we still do not have a, a validation for a large data set. Um, I would say, uh, we talked yesterday about it, but just uh, to, to keep it in a public discussion, um, um, I believe that we are probably mimicking quite well the movement, the, the confirmations that would exist exactly because we could, we could capture all those interactions that are seen in different published structures for the, the uh, um, variant that we simulated. Thanks a lot. I went in for the coffee break. We keep on stopping. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have um, one question about the flexibility about these variations in Omicron, for example. Uh, do you think this is affecting the mailing, the escaping, uh, various escape, or the binding to the AC2? Yeah, I think uh, it's affecting both. And I think this is the, um, the main reason why currently we're not seeing the open state occupancy be favored in new variants, because exactly because most of the, the at least the antibodies that we do have in uh, co-crystallized with, with the spike protein, most of them bind exactly to the receptor binding motif. And I think that actually what we are seeing now in evolution are mutations that would, will favor immune scape in any way possible. So they will favor immunescape by um, favoring the closed state occupancy, and they will also favor immunescape by uh, um, decreasing binding to the receptor, because apparently the, these interactions, are, the interactions with antibodies are mimicking quite well the interactions needed to bind to the receptor. So yeah, I, I, I'm optimistic about the, the, the future yeah. variants. Yes, because uh, some papers are showing that the um, binding affinity are increasing to the AC2, but the escaping is growing, and maybe this can be affecting the, the process. Yeah, for Omicron specifically, when we look at the individual mutations that are part of the receptor binding motif, most of, it, uh, most of them, I believe that with the exception of N501Y, uh, most of them actually individually decrease binding to, to AC2, but then there are hypotheses on how this constellation of, of mutations would maybe have a different uh, uh, result, but experimental results also on binding specifically are also not agreeing if this uh, group of mutations on the receptor binding motif are increasing or decreasing the, the binding. So we still cannot address if in the current variants, these mutations are making the binding to, to ACE2 stronger. Okay, thank you very much.